Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Medical Institute, the 2003 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Learning from Patients, the Science of Medicine, will be given by Dr. Bert Vogelstein, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and Dr. Huda Zogby. Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Baylor College of Medicine. The first lecture is titled, Research Mechanics, Putting the Brakes on Cancer. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Che. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and to our 11th annual holiday lectures on science. This program is being webcast live, and in addition, we have almost 200 students in the audience from the greater Washington, D.C. area high schools. This series is going to be available on DVD starting in the spring of 2004, and you can order these DVDs through our website. Now, the website is also a great place to learn about all of the educational programs supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and in addition, about the research activities of our 323 Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators who run laboratories across the United States. This particular series is called Learning from Patients, the Science of Medicine. And this is really a two-way street. We're going to talk about the way that biomedical scientists derive the inspiration for their research from the patients that they see in the clinic. But then, in the other direction, after figuring out the basic details of the disease process, they try to turn around and find ways that they can use this understanding to improve diagnosis and, hopefully, eventually treatment of these diseases. Now, for this exploration, we couldn't have better guides than our two speakers uh, for this series. They are both MDs. They both continue to have contact with patients while they're doing their cutting-edge research. Huda Zogby is interested in patients that have problems with their nervous system. You'll hear about that tomorrow. Today, we have Bert Vogelstein, uh, who's going to be talking about genes that are involved in the uh, process of cancer, and also particular interest in translational research. This is a term that is used to describe trying to translate or apply the information that's learned in the research laboratory back into the clinic. Now, Bert's going to talk for 40 minutes. He will ask for questions halfway through the lecture and then again at the end. So you can already be thinking uh, as he's talking about what you might ask. The title of his talk is Research Mechanics, Putting the Brakes on Cancer. I did a residency in pediatrics. That's when I first met my first cancer patients. That made a, a large impact on, on me. At that point, no one had any real idea what cancer was. It just seemed like some mysterious disease that affected people. It could come from outer space, as far as we know. Uh, it was really very hard to be hopeful uh, with the parents or with the kids. So at that point, I think my goal is solidified to doing research on cancer. And I did my postdoctoral fellowship in a cancer research laboratory, and, and I've been doing cancer research ever since that time. 
There's been a huge change in, in terms of understanding of cancer. I mean, a, re a real revolution. There's still lots of details to be learned and some major things still to be learned, but a, a general outline of how cancers form has been generated and you can kind of summarize that revolution in a single sentence. The sentence would be, cancer is, in essence, a genetic disease. So, from pessimism, or at least a feeling of hopelessness in, in the 70s, has turned to real optimism in the new century, because once you understand the disease, history shows that it's only a matter of time before you can do something about the disease. And what's critical for the future is to get young people with creative ideas uh, to work on this problem uh, and to solve it in their lifetime. And I think that's really possible now. I hope my lectures will accomplish a couple of things to educate the students about what cancer is. I want to convey to them some of the excitement that's now widely felt in, in the scientific community about cancer. And I want to stimulate those of them who are thinking about science as a career to think harder about it and to understand that this is a field where they really can make an impact, um, a difference on millions of people uh, worldwide. It's just a wonderful way to, to spend your life. Well, thank you. I'd also like to welcome you here to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. You are an essential part of this program. There will be um, hundreds of thousands of high school students who view these lectures uh, in the coming years, but you have the advantage in that you're the only ones allowed to ask questions to us because the rest will only see the CDs. So you represent all of the other high school students and um, please think about what questions all high school students may have, including those that you might have. And um, as Dennis said before, we have these wonderful lights. Just hold up a light when you want to ask a question. We, we're going to reward some questioners with, with T-shirts. So uh, look out. Um, I'm also going to ask you some questions as we go along. I'm going to try to make this an interactive program. I don't know many of your names, but uh, I'll just pick random names and hope that strikes a bell. Any of you named Jim or James? That's good. How about Ann or Anna? Anybody named Mauricio? Got it. Neorica? OK. I think we got all the common names covered then. Um, so let's start with the patient that was mentioned in that tape, Melissa. She was my first patient. This was really tragic, not only because Melissa was such a beautiful little girl uh, and because she developed cancer, but also because at that time, which was in the 70s, we really knew very little about this disease. It, it seemed just to be something which uh, came from outer space. And, and it was so hard to be optimistic that we would ever be able to do anything for kids like Melissa or older patients with cancer until we understood something. Now, 30 years later, we do understand something. There's been a real revolution in cancer research and I'm going to try to introduce you to that revolution in these two lectures. There will be four chapters. The first chapter will be the nature of cancer, what is cancer. The second will be an explanation of the genes that cause cancer, what they are and what they do. The third will be focused on how we use that information to prevent cancer in the future. And the fourth will be how we might be able to use that information to treat cancers again in the future. And let's begin with the nature of cancer. There are lots of different types of tumors, and I'll tell you the difference between cancer and tumors in a second, but cancers are a form of tumor. 
This is another form of a tumor, but it's benign, not malignant as cancers are. Benign tumors are not life-threatening. They're not particularly dangerous. You can see that small tumor on this young woman's forehead. Um, you might call it a birthmark. Probably all of you have one or two of these scientifically. They're called nevi or nevus, um, and they're really not very important. Some people even think they're beauty marks. Another kind of tumor is shown here on the vocal cords. There's uh, two of them. These are also benign. They're not dangerous. They probably wouldn't cause these patients any problems unless the patient was Britney Spears or Michael Jackson. Um, but those people have more important problems to worry about than their voice <laughs> at present. Um, tumors are not, uh, benign tumors are not defined by their size. I showed you ones that are small, but here's a slightly bigger one. Um, growing out of the salivary gland of this gentleman's uh, face, this gentleman was, uh, lived, was a Native American, lived on a, a, a reservation, and in fact wasn't able to get to uh, a hospital for a long time. It took about 30 years to grow a tumor this size, but it's still benign. So when he eventually reached the hospital, a surgeon was able to cut out the tumor, and the patient went home and lived another 30 years. So it's not size that defines the difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. Another name for a malignant tumor is a cancer. It's not size, what is it? It's something called invasiveness. On your left is another birthmark, a nevus. It's a tumor of pigment cells in your skin that determine this color of your skin. And the benign tumor is round, it's circumscribed, it has smooth borders. It can be removed easily by a dermatologist or a surgeon. But the one on the right is malignant. And the difference is not so much the size, but the fact that it's not smooth any longer. It's invading. It's uh, invading through the skin laterally. And more importantly, it's also invading in three dimensions. So it's invading underneath the skin. It will eventually hit a blood vessel or a lymphatic, and then tumor cells can go inside the vasculature, that is the vessels, the blood vessels, and travel to other parts of the body. That is called metastasis. When a malignant tumor reaches a blood vessel or lymphatic, travels throughout the bloodstream, reaches other organs like the lungs or the liver, and starts to form a new tumor, a kind of colony of the original tumor in the new place. And that's why people die, because of metastases. The primary tumors can almost always be removed surgically, but if the tumors aren't detected until after they've metastasized, then it's too late. The Greeks recognized this invasiveness of cancer very early on, and that's why they called it cancer which means a crab. They saw the invasive arms of the cancer, such as in the melanoma I just showed you, and that reminded them of the claws of the crab. And this animation shows, um, in, shows what happens in, uh, in a, a tumor. There are cells which are dividing abnormally. We'll see how in a few minutes. They keep dividing at the expense of the normal cells that surround them. And in three dimensions, once they divide enough, they start to pop out. You can begin to see them with your naked eye, not just under a microscope. And then they recruit blood vessels. They need to recruit blood vessels in order to grow to a size that's greater than just a tenth of an inch in diameter. The blood vessels supply oxygen and nutrients. And the last stage is the metastatic stage. That blue cell in the middle represents a metastatic cell that has come from the primary tumor, invaded into the blood vessel, and now can also get out of the blood vessel, invade another tissue, and 
form new cells there. The end process of the uh, metastatic lesion, the metastatic process, is shown here. On your left is a normal lung, an x-ray, and on the right is a picture of a patient who originally had a breast tumor that had metastasized to the lung. So the tumor cells from the breast had invaded a blood vessel and traveled to the lung where they have formed uh, nodules composed of breast cancer cells. Another example is provided by colon cancers. Colon cancers start in the colon, of course, and they invade a different kind of vessel. It's called a portal vein, and it connects the intestines to the liver. The cells which invade wind up in the liver, and on this next slide, you can see a normal liver on your left, and on the right is a liver that has been invaded by colon cancer cells, metastatic colon cancer cells. Each of those nodules represents an individual cancer cell which has made its way to the liver and started to multiply. Each of those nodules now contains several hundred million cells, and the liver will eventually be totally replaced by cancer. A person can't live without his liver, so that's why this person will die. Now, there are lots of kinds of cancers. Cancer is often thought of as a single disease, uh, in the newspaper, but it's really not. It's hundreds of different diseases. For every person in this room, there's at least one form of cancer. For every cell type in the body, there's at least one form of cancer. And they're different. Um, for example, a breast cancer is different than a melanoma or a colon cancer. On your left is a normal breast, a mammogram, the kind of test that women are expected um, to get so that Breast tumors can be detected before they're metastatic. And on your right is an example of a breast tumor, a cancer, that has been detected by mammography. Another kind of cancer that particularly affects young people is leukemias. On your left is a normal blood smear. That is, a drop of blood is taken from a patient and smeared on a slide, really just smeared and then stained with dyes. You can see all the red cells. Uh, most of the cells in the blood are, of course, red cells. But there are also a few white cells. Those are normally there, and they help prevent infections, guard against infections. But in a blood smear from a leukemia patient, there's still a few normal-looking blood cell, normal-looking white cells. But most of the white cells are these large and abnormal forms, which represent the leukemia cells. And because these cells are already in the blood, they're a cancer of blood cells. They spread immediately throughout the body, and they have to be treated immediately for the patient to survive. Now, despite the fact that all of these tumors um, are different in some ways, they also have something in common. And what they have in common is that there is an abnormal ratio between cell birth and cell death. So in a normal adult tissue, say the skin or the intestines, cells are always dividing in the skin and in the intestines. There's always a very specific ratio of cell birth and cell death. Can anybody tell me what that ratio is? Just raise your hand or your lighter. One, exactly has to be exactly one. For every cell that's born, one cell dies. If too many cells die, more cells die than are born, the tissue will shrink. It will atrophy. On the other hand, if more cells are born than die, that's a tumor. That's a physiologic definition of a tumor. And it doesn't require much of an increase of that ratio in order to get a big tumor over time. You can think about this like interest. Any of you working in a lab this summer? OK. So if I were to ask you, um, if I were to offer you a million dollars to work in my lab um, over the summer, you would probably take it, right? OK. <laughs> I'm not going to offer you that much. Um, suppose I offer you a penny. 
but I tell you that every day you'll get 25% interest, 25 interest on that penny. So after one day, you'll have 1.26 cents, and after two days, you'll have 1.6 cents, and three days, 1.9 cents. Would you rather have the penny with interest or the million dollars? Uh, everybody. Who, who would rather have the penny? 100 days, one summer. And who would ha rather have the million dollars? OK, good. So most of you chose wisely. A few of you chose poorly. Um, <laughs> those of you who took the penny would end up with 40 mi 49 million dollars. Those of you who took the million, you wouldn't do so bad, but you'd still only have a million after the end of the summer. So now, this same kind of thing happens in tumors. It only requires a slight difference in the ratio of cell birth to cell death to develop a very large tumor over time. And since most tumors take 20 to 30 years to develop, it really only requires a difference of 1% in that ratio to get a huge tumor over decades. And that is the common underlying theme of tumor genesis. Um, just to go over that again in graphic form, when a normal cell divides, every normal cell, two cells are of course formed, but one of those cells will die. So cell division, you get two cells, one of those cells eventually dies, leaving the net the same as the beginning, one cell. But in a tumor, it's quite different, as again shown on this movie. The tumor cells, which are mutant, we'll see in a few minutes why they're mutant. The cell divides, but one of the daughter cells doesn't die. They keep being more cells, more cells, more cells over time. And that starts a benign tumor. Again. To review the difference among tumors, there are three kinds, all called tumors. The first is benign. It's not dangerous, it's not life-threatening, and it's not invasive. The second type is malignant. This is dangerous. It's locally invasive. That means it can invade surrounding tissues. Eventually, the malignant tumor may become metastatic, in which case it can travel to other parts of the body. And that's when the real problem occurs. In the next chapter, we'll discuss the molecular basis for this process. But now we'll quit and ask for questions. How much time do we have for questions? Five minutes. Good. Just raise your hand or light, yes. How is it possible to tell if when a benign tumor is going to turn malignant or metastatic? Um, can, can you all hear that question? The question was, how do you tell if a benign tumor is going to become malignant? The only person who can tell is the oracle. Um, it's, you can't. It's just stochastic, we'll see, which means it's random. Um, you can look at a benign tumor. You can estimate the probability that it may turn into a malignant tumor. But you, you can't tell for sure. And uh, in the next chapter of this lecture, you, you, I think you'll understand why. Other questions? Yes? You said the cancer cells, they travel through the blood vessels. Are they selective in the tissue they choose to? Are they? Are the cancer cells selective for the tissues they choose? Yes, they are. Sometimes investigators call that the seed in the soil. Certain kinds of cancers only grow in certain tissues in metastatic form. For example, prostate cancers generally go to the bone marrow, whereas colon cancers generally go to the liver. Do we know the reason for that? The reason for that, no. We don't know the reason for that. In fact, we don't understand the basis for a metastasis in general uh, either. And that's what some of you are going to help us find out over the next 10 years. Yes? My name is Crystal Shavers, and I attend Margaret Murray Washington Career Senior High School. 
Um, is it more difficult to control a massive malignant tumor or a mastectic tumor? The question about controlling a massive malignant tumor or a metastatic tumor. Massive malignant tumors, first of all, they usually don't become really massive as long as people have access to, to medical care because people notice them um, if they're really big. But, e but there are some tumors that have been taken out that have weighed 250 pounds. Um, these are in morbidly obese people, and they occur inside the abdomen. And they thought they were just getting fat, but they weren't. Um, they they were, uh, had a tumor growing inside, and that can be removed surgically. It's really not a problem until the metastases because if the metastatic cells invade the liver or the lung, you can't take out somebody's liver or lung. Um, so then the person is in trouble. So that's really the problem. We have time for one more question, yes. Okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Tiffany Fields. I attend Spangon Senior High School. And the question I wanted to ask was when you stated earlier that like the tumors are caused when the cell keeps multiplying, is there any way that we could like per um, paralyze that cell that's multiplying so that it won't be so many? Right. Good question. Can we paralyze um, cells so that they'll stop multiplying? In fact, that's what cancer therapy is, um, is attempts to try and stop cancer cells from developing. There's also something called preventive uh, drugs, which try to prevent even early tumors from multiplying rather than shrinking tumors, which are large. All cancer drugs do that now to some extent. Unfortunately, they also stop normal cells from growing, so, so they're toxic. If any of you have ever seen patients who are treated for leukemia or cancer, you know they lose their hair, they feel bad, they're nauseous. That's because the drugs so far work on both normal cells and cancer cells. They're not selective. Hopefully, the next generation of drugs will be more selective. Okay. Um, I'm not going to th throw them, but you could, can you hand them back <laughs> there to those questioners? Um, Thank you. All right, let's go on to part two. Now, when I was uh, treating Melissa back in the 70s for her leukemia, we again had no idea of what caused her cancer. There were lots of theories. Theories are cheap. Some people thought that cancers were caused by viruses. Others thought that cancers were caused by bacteria or other infectious agents. Still others thought there was a breakdown in immunity. Most forms of cancer don't occur in people until they're middle-aged or older. It's also known that immunity tends to get decreased, tends to decrease with age. So it's a reasonable theory that perhaps when immunity breaks down, cancers pop up. And still others thought that there were that there were mutations in specific genes that caused tumors. Now, it turns out in general that this last theory is the right one. That's the basis of the cancer re revolution. Mutations in specific cancer genes cause the disease. So cancer is, in essence, a genetic disease. But it's different than most other genetic diseases with which you're familiar. For example, Let's look at some common genetic diseases. Um, DMD is a gene which, when mutated, causes muscular dystrophy. Assume you all know what muscular dystrophy is. It occurs in children, causes them muscle problems. It's a very severe disease. Now, um, some of you probably live in rural communities. In Bowie or Gaithers Gaithersburg, anybody live there? Uh, anyone live in, in an urban? setting, Washington, D.C., city. Now, the air is probably cleaner in, in, in the rural environment. You don't have all the car fumes. Environment may be better. If you had the same mutation in, a D, in the DMD gene, would that alter the disease that you would get? Would the muscular dystrophy be better or worse, depending on where you lived? Anybody? Who thinks it would be better if you lived in Gaithersburg? 
who thinks anything would be better if you lived in Gage. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, of course, it doesn't matter where you live. If you have a mutation in the DMD gene, you're going to get exactly the same disease. It's totally independent of environment. The disease is only dependent on the specific mutation. A somewhat more complex case is caused by mutations in a gene called LDLR, which predisposes to heart disease. But not everybody who has a mutation in LDLR will get heart disease. It's not like muscular dystrophy, where everyone who has a mutation in DMD will get muscular dystrophy. It's only if a person with an LDLR mutation is exposed to specific environmental influences, in particular diet, fats in the diet, that they will get heart disease. And the severity of the disease is then determined both by the genetic component, this mutation that they inherit, other genes, and their diet. So it's more complex. And cancer is even more complex than that, although it's related. Some patients inherit a mutation in a gene which predisposes them to cancer. They won't necessarily get cancer, but they are more likely to get cancer than a person who doesn't have an inheritable mutation in this gene. And there are lots of genes. This is just an example, one of them, MLH1. In order for them to actually develop a cancer, they need more stuff. And in this case, what they need is more mutations. No single mutation actually causes cancer. It's an accumulation of mutations in the same cell until the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. When enough mutations are accumulated, then uh, cancer results. And you can think about this process in terms of waves of clonal expansion. Pretend each of these white balls represents a normal cell. Suppose one of those cells becomes mutant. Then it will proliferate. Its ratio of cell birth to cell death will increase to greater than 1, and it will proliferate over and above that of the normal cells. Um, that is a, called a clone. Now, it's different than a clone like Dolly the sheep, right? That's an organism clone. This is just a cell clone. But it's the same idea. A cell with the same genetic characteristics is um, proliferating and making identical copies of itself. But that's not the end of the story, because once this mutant cell forms a benign tumor, it can also get more mutations, or a cell from the benign tumor can get another mutation. And through a second wave of clonal expansion, expand to become malignant, invasive. And of course, the malignant cell, or one of the malignant cells, can subse subse subsequently accumulate another mutation and become metastatic. Uh, any of you um, see that movie called Multi Multiplicity? with Michael Keane? Well, it's, it's a bit like that. Remember, Michael Keane wanted to clone himself because he didn't have enough time. Uh, turned out not to be such a great idea. But um, he cloned himself. The first clone was OK, but the next clone was worse. And he, with each successive clone, there were more mistakes that were made. That's like mutations, till eventually you got a very stupid Michael Keane. And it's the same kind of thing that happens in tumors, successive waves of clonal mutations until you get a very bad one. In this case, not stupid, but evil. Now, it's important to recognize that these mutations, like mutations that cause muscular dystrophy and heart disease, are sometimes inherited. But usually, they're not. Cancer, in general, is not a hereditary disease. There are cases of cancer which are uh, hereditary, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. But generally, the mutations occur after birth. Um, now, the only mutations that are hereditary are those that occur in egg or sperm cells. They can be transmitted from father or mother to son or daughter. 
other mutations that occur in any of the other cells of the body obviously cannot be transmitted to a son or daughter. Now the germ cells, the egg cells and the stem cells are only a very small proportion of the total cells, the total trillion cells in the body, 50 trillion cells. There are only a few million uh, germ cells at any one time. So it's just a really small fraction of germ cells. All the other mutations that occur in other cells aren't important, they're not hereditary, but they can cause cancers. Um, now, what are these genes that get these mutations, either inherited or after birth? There are only three kinds. One kind is called an oncogene. These genes normally, because they're all normal until they're mutated, everybody has them. Everybody has oncogenes, but they're normal, and they normally stimulate growth. They're what you need to grow to live. But if an oncogene becomes mutated, it's like having an accelerator in a car that's stuck to the floor because there's a heavy weight on the foot. The car continues to go, to go even if the driver wants to stop it by lifting her foot off the accelerator pedal. And that's just what a mutation in an oncogene does in a cell. It makes the cell continue to grow, whereas normally without the mutation, the cell would stop growing because it's being controlled properly. And this analogy works, too, for the second kind of gene, which is called suppressor gene. These are the cell's breaks. These normally inhibit growth. And a mutation in a suppressor gene is much like having a dysfunctional break. And just as cars have more than one brake, they have a foot brake, they have a hand brake or emergency brake, and if all else fails, you can pull the key out of the ignition. Cells have multiple brakes, too. And it's only when several brakes plus an accelerator or two all become dysfunctional in an automobile that the car spins out of control, and it's the same in a cell. It's only when several of these genes become mutated, don't work properly, that the cell spins out of control and becomes a metastatic cancer. There's a third kind of gene which doesn't directly cause tumor genesis when mutant, but only indirectly does it. And these are repair genes. Having a faulty repair gene is like having an inept mechanic. Can't fix the mistakes that are made. And cells are always making mistakes, always. Um, now, you'd think that with five billion years of evolution, you'd have evolved a system that's not so prone to mistakes, so we wouldn't have cancers through these mutations. Can anybody suggest why evolution hasn't gone that far and made DNA polymerases, etc., that uh, are perfect? Yes. Um, so that would eliminate um, the uh, variety in the genetic code in Correct. the species. Mistakes are part of evolution. In, in fact, you can look at cancer as a side effect of evolution. If, if mistakes weren't made, we'd all be amoebas. We wouldn't be here in this auditorium. Unfortunately, cells are still making mistakes, and they can cause disease, both hereditary diseases and cancer. Now, are our cells still making mistakes now? Um, Krista, somebody named Krista in the audience? Krista McAllister? Okay. Look behind you. There's a guy named Dan. Is he a mutant? Look carefully. <laughs> Look, you sure? All right, well, you're wrong. He's a mutant. We're all mutants, right? Because the egg and sperm that gave rise to us, there was a mutation, at least one, probably a few. Now, those mutations didn't occur in genes which cause disease, hopefully. But we all are mutants in that sense. Now, let's look for a minute about, uh, at these genes in more detail. And we'll start with suppressor genes. Suppressor genes are important because they cause many forms of 
familial cancers, inherited cancers. In the United States this year, about 135,000 people will develop colon cancer. Uh, in the world, about a million people this year. Most of them, 85 to 90 percent, they're non-familial. That is, they'll be the only people in their family to develop colon cancer. No one else has their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, their cousins. Um, so they're non-familial. But a small fraction, roughly 10 to 15 percent, occur in a familial pattern. And there are two major forms of familial colon cancer. One's called FAP for polyposis, and the other one's called HNPCC. The operative letters are NP for non-polyposis. A picture of a colon with, uh, from a patient with polyposis is shown here. You can see all of those bumps are polyps. Polyps are just benign tumors. Sometimes they're called adenomas. That's why FAP actually stands for familial adenomatous uh, polyposis, but we'll just call it polyposis for short. And this patient has lots of these polyps. They're benign tumors, but there are lots of them. In fact, there are roughly 5,000 such benign tumors in the colon of each patient with polyposis. Some of those tumors eventually are going to progress to cancer. So patients, unless they're treated for this disease, will generally get colon cancer by the time they're in, four, in their 40s. They usually start to develop the polyps when they're in their teens. This syndrome is caused by a classic tumor suppressor gene called APC. It's just a cellular break that goes awry, can be inherited in a mutant form, and cause this disease. The other form of hereditary colon cancer is caused by repair gene defects. That form is, caused, is called HNPCC non-polyposis. The difference between non-polyposis and polyposis is just what its name suggests. There are lots of polyps in polyposis, but in HNPCC, the non-polyposis, there's usually only a single tumor. Uh, a single tumor shown here, a large tumor, in fact, a cancer. Not thousands of polyps, just a single tumor. And the genes that cause this disease are called uh, mismatch repair genes. Um, this animation shows how they work. There's a polymerase, DNA polymerase, which copies both strands of the DNA, the top strand and the bottom strand. Sometimes those two strands are called Watson and Crick strand. But they're not perfect, as we just mentioned. Sometimes they make mistakes. And the kind of mistake they might make is, you'll see in a second, to incorporate the wrong nucleotide. Normally, there's going to be an A opposite a T and a C opposite a G. But suppose it makes a mistake and copies a T where a C should be. That should be GC, but now there's a T. So that's a mistake, a potential mutation. Fortunately, cells have repair systems that can erase those mutations. And those repair proteins indicated here, called MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, PMS2, the names don't matter. What's important is that they recruit another enzyme called exo-1, exonuclease, which chops off the mutant strand. And then it allows a DNA polymerase to come by and synthesize the correct strand, thereby fixing up the DNA and making it normal. Now, if a patient doesn't have a proper mismatch repair system, then the cell with that defect will accumulate mutations much more quickly than a normal cell. And that's why these patients with HNPCC develop cancer. They have defects in this repair system. And one of the things that's important about this defect is it accelerates, telescopes, the whole process. In polyposis, the whole scheme of mutations, the multiple mutations in addition to the inherited one that are required to get to a malignant or metastatic cancer generally takes 20 to 30 years. So patients don't get tumors and don't get malignant cancers or die from their disease until they're in their 40s. 
but in non-polyposis, this whole process only takes a few years, from a small benign tumor to a malignant tumor, only three to five years. Um, the mismatch repair system, in essence, functions like a spell checker on your word processing program. Now, let's put all this together. Um, and in colorectal tumors. Starting from normal cells, um, the first mutation might cause a very small microscopic small tumor, which then could grow over time to a large benign tumor. Both these are benign. Another mutation might cause a wave of clonal evolution, causing a malignant tumor and a metastatic cancer. The genes that drive this process have been identified. APC, the gene that causes polyposis, is the gene that starts it all off. It initiates the process. It's a cellular break. And then tumors enlarge when they acquire other mutations in oncogenes, like KRAS. They become malignant when they acquire still other genes, mutations in other genes, um, like SMAD4 and P53 and still mutations in other genes, an oncogene called PRL3, can help drive it to metastases. All of these genes are mutated in most colon cancers. Now, one of my favorite genes is P53. Um, P53 is uh, mutated, like all of the others, in part because there's some sort of faulty repair, but it's my favorite gene because a graduate student in our lab named Susie Baker discovered its role uh, about 15 years ago, and she was uh, not much older th than you guys, actually. Um, she discovered that P53 mutations occurred in just about all colon cancers, and then another graduate student named Janice Nigro worked with her to find that P53 was mutant in virtually every cancer that occurs throughout the world. It's hard to be a cancer without getting a P53 mutation. So all of these different tumor types have mutations in P53. It's kind of a common denominator for cancer. And knowing that, we can um, do some interesting kinds of experiments to try and relate the initial insult to the mutation. And here are some examples. Sunlight, um, such as you get when you're on the beach. Everybody likes the beach. Anybody use a tanning salon? Raise your hand if you do. OK. Well, you not only will get a good tan, you may get a mutation. Um, at codon 2, <laughs> that one of the uh, residues of P53 changes a C to a T. Now, this is a characteristic mutation caused by sunlight. Um, if you uh, radiate with ultraviolet light sunlight bacteria, they get this kind of mutation, a C to a T. And that mutation occurs in the P53 gene in skin cancers. Skin cancers are, of course, induced by ultraviolet light you'd find them much more rarely in other forms of tumors, which, of course, are not exposed to light. Another example is aflatoxin. It's a fungal toxin found in parts of Asia and Africa, and um, it causes a different mutation. At residue 249 of P53, it causes liver cancer. So it's found only in the liver cancers of people who live in that area and are exposed to that toxin, not found in other tumor types. And of course, one of the worst forms of carcinogens are found in cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke, we now know, causes cancers by, in part, inducing mutations in P53 um, at this position. And they, of course, occur in lung tumors, but not in other tumors. And in colon cancers, it's a more complex scenario. We know specific mutations in P53 that occur but we don't know um, exactly what the carcinogen is. That's something that remains in the future. Now, how does P53 work? P53 works as shown in this animation. P53 molecule, protein, binds to specific sequences adjacent to genes which it controls. 
There's a P53 molecule binding to its site, its binding site. It recruits an RNA polymerase, not a DNA polymerase, that then makes RNA from these genes that it controls. And the RNA is translated into two proteins. P53 primarily regulates two proteins called, in the next slide, WAF and PUMA. Now, WAF is a cellular break. Puma is a different kind of gene. Um, WAF, one of the nice things about discovering genes is you can name them anything you want. WAF was named for Wafik Aldiri, who was the student in our lab who discovered it. And Puma was named by Jen Yu because she was a runner and she liked their shoes. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, my favorite names for genes, there's one in flower called Superman, another one called Clark Kent. So one of the one of the good things about being a scientist. At any rate, what do these genes do? The P21 uh, uh, works as a break. Um, look at this movie. Here's a typical break. That didn't work. Um, if you don't have P53, you don't have the regulation of P21, a break. Um, the Puma works differently. It's a kind of a hairy carry gene. Uh, if all else fails, what the cell does to control itself is to commit hairy carry. Really, it's suicide. It's not accidental death. It's very purposeful. Scientific name is apoptosis, but it's, it's really a form of suicide. And um, it protects the organism from the development of cancer. Obviously, it kills the cell, but it's good for the organism. And the last kind of gene, which I'll just briefly touch because we'll discuss this further in the second lecture, is oncogenes. Um, oncogenes, again, are the accelerators in a car. And oncogenes get activated often by chromosome translocations. And in the second lecture, we'll talk about one specific translocation that causes leukemia a translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. And the interesting thing about this translocation is that its discovery has led to a novel therapy for that form of leukemia. And that's where I'm going to stop and ask for questions. Yes? How do mutagens produce such specificity that the mutations produced? How do mutagens produce such specificity. Mutagens are, mutagens are chemicals, and chemicals bind to specific sequences with, within DNA and the proteins that DNA uh, is packaged by. So because they're chemicals, like all chemicals, they have certain charges, certain distributions of forces, which direct them to specific molecules. Now, they'll react with lots of DNA throughout the cell. They only cause a problem if they mutate an oncogene or a suppressor gene. If they mutate a gene for hemoglobin, it doesn't matter. That's not going to cause a tumor. But uh, in an individual cell with a mutation of an oncogene or tumor suppressor gene, that could represent a step towards cancer. Yes? Uh, my name is Greg Swider. I'm representing Fairfax High School. Um, in your chart that had P53 with all the different cancers, all the base pairs were changed to thymine. Is there a reason for that, or is that just coincidence? Um, I'll have to go back, but I think it was coincidence. Okay. Yes? Uh, I'm in Russia with the Potomac School. Um, if someone had a familiar cancer, would there be any way to fix the mutated gene so that it couldn't be passed on? The question is, can you fix a mutated gene in an hereditary tumor type? And the answer is, in theory, yes. In practice, no. Um, you can do it. Uh, what, what, that, that's really not going to happen because of the uh, serious ethical implications. What people can do is that with in vitro fertilization techniques, you can select an embryo cell that doesn't have a mutation to implant. So if a couple is known to have a hereditary mutation, you can select an embryonic cell through in vitro fertilization that it is devoid of the mutation, thereby ensuring that particular child that develops from that embryo will not have the disease. But fixing it is, is not on the table. Yes? 
I was just wondering, as a potential patient, I have tumors all over my body, right? And some of them are bigger than others, but how would I distinguish between a benign and malignant and metastatic, and when should I consult the doctor? Um, that's a good question. The tumors you'll generally see are the ones on your skin. If you feel anything inside, you should immediately consult your doctor because you can't tell whether a tumor is benign or malignant um, from feeling it inside you. But if you're talking about tumors on your skin, the general rule is if it's round and circumscribed, it's benign and you don't have to worry about it, um, especially if it's small. If it starts to grow, if you see a change or, or you, you see it start to spread uh, or it turns color, then you should immediately see a physician. But everybody should see their physician once a year anyway and, and just ask him or her to look at any suspicious lesions. You shouldn't have to guess. That's what doctors are for, um, to save you the trouble uh, of making those kinds of decisions. Other questions? Yes? Why isn't cancer more prevalent amongst children who are like um, left rapidly dividing cells due to growth? And uh, that, that's a good question. Cancer is not simply a, a, a function of dividing cells. For example, the cells of your small intestine divide much more frequently, in fact, every day, than the cells in your brain. Brain cells hardly ever divide. Yet brain tumors are pretty common, and small intestinal cancers never occur. So it's something more than just cell division, and we don't understand exactly what that is. Yes? Um, Lily Young, Thomas Jefferson High School. In cancer cells, are there usually multiple mutations in genes coding for apoptosis factors, or is the mutation in p53 enough to stop the process? Yeah, in every cancer that forms, uh, in every cancer that forms, there are several mutations, at least uh, four or five, uh, and certainly in every metastatic cancer. So it's p53. In colon cancers, plus APC, plus RAS, plus uh, other mutations that are on that slide, all of them occur. Each one inactivates a different growth controlling pathway. Again, it's very much like a car. You can control the car until you lose all your brakes and your accelerator. Losing just one, you can still control the car. And that's a pretty good analogy for what happens in a cell. Um, that's it. We have a break. See you in a minute. Thanks for the great talk, Bert, and uh, now we're going to, and also thank the students for those fantastic questions. We're going to now take a 30-minute break. When we return, Bert will continue his discussion of the genetics of cancer and how that's critical to both prevention and treatment. Mm -hmm.